We left off last week talking about Ulrich Zwingli. Actually, there was something I wanted to show you from, this is from ChristianHistory.net, is the website of what used to be a print magazine called Christian History Magazine, which was a subsidiary of Christianity Today. So Christianity Today published Christian History Magazine, and they continue to uh, publish some things online at ChristianHistory.net. There were a couple things that I wanted to show you from this article on Zwingli from ChristianHistory.net. One is this quote right at the beginning, because it's a really, really good quote, and uh, one that pertains to kind of the theme that I'm trying to emphasize as we work through the Reformation, that the Reformation is the result of the Word of God impacting people's lives through the power of the Spirit, and it is not some sort of... um, its ultimate cause cannot be credited to the ingenuity or creativity or even brilliance of the men whom God used. God used them and they were courageous and they were brilliant, but God used them in spite of their efforts to accomplish what it was he wanted to accomplish and it was really his word that was accomplishing. And we saw that in Luther at the end of his life who says, I've done nothing, it's the word of God that has done everything. And we see it here in Zwingli, where he compares the Word of God to the Rhine River. And uh, even what we talked about on Thursday, I mean, he was born in the Alps, loved the Alps, even sometimes reinterpreted the Psalms so that, you know, it's not just that the Lord leads his sheep as a good shepherd in Psalm 23, it's that he leads them in pastures of the Alps and by the rivers of the Alps. So he kind of regionalized everything. Um only in his own devotional sense. But here's what he says about the Bible, and I think this is really, really helpful. He says, For God's sake, do not put yourself at odds with the Word of God, for truly it will persist as surely as the Rhine follows its course. One can perhaps dam it up for a while, but it is impossible to stop it. And, of course, the reference there to... A dam is a reference to the Roman Catholic obstacles that had been put in place due to the corruption that was so prevalent in the church at that time. And Zwingli's point is that eventually the Word of God bursts through the dam and overwhelms everything that is in its course, in its path. And I think that's really a great picture of what the Reformation was, that the Word of God could no longer be contained by the thin veneers of hypocritical religion, and eventually it burst forth. And as it did, empowered by the Spirit, it transformed millions of individual lives, which consequently transformed the entire face of Western Europe. Uh, The other thing I wanted to uh, just read a couple paragraphs here, um, because we were talking about how Zwingli became a priest in... uh, I believe it was 1506 when he became a priest there in Glarus, and he had been already exposed earlier at the University of Basel to some of the writings of Erasmus through Thomas Wittenbach and kind of this idea of humanism, rediscovering the humanities, rediscovering the Word of God in the original languages. And by the time we get out of his time in Glarus and then Einsiedeln, we get to 1519 when he comes to Zurich, and we find that he is a changed person. He has embraced the doctrines of the Reformation by that point. But there's no clear date when we say, wow, he really was converted at this particular time. It's not like Luther where we have a statement of his testimony. With Zwingli, it's more that he kind of enters this time of priesthood, and 12 years later when he comes to Zurich, he's a changed individual. It's more of a process. Well, how does that process happen? Uh, The writer here gives us just a little bit of insight into that. That paragraph there at the top. It took Zwingli years to discover the power of the word. After graduating from the University of Basel in 1506, he became a parish priest in Glarus. From the beginning, he took his priestly duties seriously. He later wrote, Though I was young, ecclesiastical duties inspired in me more fear than joy, because I knew and remained convinced that I would give an account of the blood of the sheep which would perish as a consequence of my carelessness. That's a great quote. It's a great reminder for pastoral ministry. So Luther is motivated by fear for his own soul, his own condemnation, 
Zwingli is similarly motivated by fear, but it's more in the sense of the fear of giving an account for his pastoral stewardship as an under-shepherd. Um, 1 Peter 5, an under-shepherd who will soon give an account. The feeling of responsibility for his charge, rather than like Luther, a personal search for salvation, motivated Zwingli's increasing interest in the Bible. In an age when priests were often unfamiliar with the scriptures, Zwingli became enamored with it, first after purchasing a copy of Erasmus' New Testament Latin translation. He began teaching himself Greek, bought a copy of the Erasmus of Erasmus' Greek New Testament, and started memorizing long passages. And then when he came to Zurich in 1519, he began preaching from the New Testament regularly. So, so we see that transformation for him personally, and it's a transformation just like Luther, where it is his own investigation and study and meditation on the Word of God that transforms his own heart, whereby he can then preach a message that will transform his entire region. And so there's a personal reformation that takes place before there is the unleashing of reformation power. Again, not from Zwingli, but from God's Spirit through His Word being proclaimed that then is a consequence in His ministry. Okay, so I just wanted you to see some of that so we can kind of connect the dots again with what the theme is that we're trying to emphasize, that the Reformation is the result of the Word of God being unleashed in people's lives. All right, so that brings us then to about the midway point here in our lecture on Zwingli. And we already talked about his ministry in Zurich and to a certain degree, the first few years where he became the priest there of the great minister chapel and where he began preaching, starting in Matthew, verse by verse, expository preaching, because he loved the word of God and saw the treasure of its truth. He made that the... Um, the sole focus of his ministry, and it was the catalyst that not only changed his own heart, but changed those who came and listened to him. As a result of this, he began preaching against Roman Catholic abuses, preaching against indulgences, fasting, private confession, the Mass, icons, tithing, intercession of the saints, purgatory. And uh, we talked a little bit about the regulative principle that he applied to ministry. And uh, we left off on Tuesday, uh, excuse me, on Thursday of last week, we left off talking about uh, his act of, um, of uh, I suppose, rebellion or resistance uh, when he and some fellow priests went and had a sausage bake there in the middle of Zurich during the middle of the feast, uh, excuse me, the fast of Lent. So... Uh, right there in the middle of the day, uh, they decided to violate the fast in a very public way. So kind of like with Luther where he burns his bull of indulgence there in the middle of Wittenberg. Here we have Zwingli um, lighting a fire similarly, but he's roasting sausages. I kind of like his method better, especially as we look forward to lunchtime collectively. Um, and I remember that we stopped there because then we broke for pizza lunch on Thursday. Okay, so that's where we're going to pick up. Uh, we also talked just briefly about the fact that Zwingli got married in 1522. That marriage was made public in 1524. And um, Luther actually got married in 1525. So it was just after Zwingli. And again, we have with Zwingli and with Luther, and then in the next generation with Calvin and Knox, we have Protestant pastoral marriages and families, which is something that is brand new, something that's considered radical, uh, even though from a biblical New Testament standpoint, it's not radical at all. And even Peter himself, the first pope, quote-unquote, from a Roman Catholic perspective, had a wife. We know that because he had a mother-in-law, and I think we talked a little bit on Thursday about even some of the things in church history uh, regarding Peter and his wife. So, And of course, the uh, qualifications even for eldership that Paul, who was the one that highlighted the benefits of singleness, he nonetheless included being the husband of one wife as a qualification 
showing that marriage is not in any way in competition with faithfulness in ministry. All right, now we get to talk about some of these disputations that Zwingli held before the city council of Zurich. Unlike Wittenberg, which all of this is within the borders of the Holy Roman Empire, but unlike Wittenberg, which was ruled over by a prince, so you have a monarch, a monarchical system, um, and Luther was very careful to always want to maintain that uh, order to honor the king, to honor the government. He did not in any way promote uh, the political revolutionary mindset of some of the radicals like Thomas Munzer and the Zwickau prophets and others who we'll talk about in just a moment when we talk about the Anabaptists. In Zurich, as it was in all of Switzerland, it was actually a republic. And uh, the cantons of Switzerland had gained and maintained a certain level of independence. And even though they were technically within the borders of the Holy Roman Empire, they were all independent city-states. These cantons or counties or provinces were ruled over by a city, in this case the city of Zurich in the canton of Zurich. And that city was ruled by a city council. So we don't have a king, we have a city council. And Zwingli, in order to make changes and reforms in the church, is going to be very, very careful to make sure that he gets permission from the city council. Uh, Zwingli himself, you might remember, was the son of a bailiff uh, who was a civil servant. So Zwingli himself had sort of an affinity towards civil government. He certainly saw Romans 13 as teaching the Christian submission to the state. And in a context where we don't really have a marriage of church, uh, or we do have a marriage of church and state, we don't really have a separation of church and state like we experience here in America. In that context, it's very important from Zwingli's perspective to make sure that the city council is on board with all of the reforms that he makes in the church. And so he holds this disputation or this public debate in order to convince the city council that Zurich needs to become Protestant. So on January 29th, 1523, Zwingli presents his 67 articles. So Luther had his 95 theses. Zwingli has 67 articles. And uh, though not quite as many as the 95 theses, these 67 articles are perhaps a more well-developed articulation of true Protestant doctrine than the 95 theses were. The 95 theses were just essentially arguments against the sale of indulgences, the 67 Articles is a more broad, sweeping, developed set of theses for why Zurich should stop being Catholic and start being Protestant. There's over 600 who attend. A man named Faber was sent by the Bishop of Constance to defend the Roman Catholic position. And Zwingli defended himself against that position, and as a result, the city council overwhelmingly ruled in favor of Zwingli to allow him to continue to make reforms in the church there, in the great minister church, and to preach the gospel in Zurich. And at this point, Zurich officially becomes Protestant. Uh, it's important for us to read just a few of the 67 articles in the same way that we looked at some of the 95 theses. This is a critical uh, document at the early stage of the Protestant Reformation. So here's just a few of these. Number one, all who say that the gospel is invalid without the confirmation of the church err and slander God. Well, what is that? That is sola scriptura. It is... Zwingli's way of saying that the scripture and the gospel of scripture are authoritative in and of themselves. We don't need the church or the authority of the church to tell us what to believe. Number 19, Christ is the only mediator between God and ourselves. Well, that is solus Christus. Not only is Christ alone the head of the church, but Christ alone is the one mediator between God and man. We do not need a human priest to make intercession for us. 
Number 20, God will always give everything in Christ's name. Once we, it follows that for our part after this life, we need no mediator except him. So it's just a reiteration of the same point. And uh, I think even a, a tacit um, critique of the intercession to saints that so many people in medieval Europe were prone to uh, doing. And uh, no, we pray to Christ. He is our mediator. He is our advocate before the Father. We don't pray to a saint. We don't pray to Mary. We don't need a human priest. We have the Son of God himself. When we pray for one another on earth, we do so in such a way that we believe that all things are to be given to us through Christ alone. So there is that phrase. Christ is our justification, from which follows that our good works, if they are of Christ, are good, but if ours, they are neither right or good. So we are saved by Christ's work alone, and once we are saved, we continue to produce good works, but they are the fruit of the Spirit not the basis for our salvation, the fruit of our regeneration. And those works are good, he says, if they are of Christ. But if we're relying on our own works to save us, those works are neither good or right. They are like filthy rags in the eyes of a holy God. So that's really sola fide. 24, no Christian is bound to do those things which God has not decreed. Hence, anyone or may eat at all times all food. Well, there's the defense of his, you know, sausage bake that he had had earlier where he had defied the fast of Lent and probably provoked the entire city of Zurich to jealousy as they smelled the deliciousness floating by their windows while they were all hungry. 27. All Christian men are brethren of Christ and brothers to one another, and the title of father should not be assumed by anyone on earth. In fact, Christ even said let no one be called father. This includes orders, sects, and factions. So again, a clear defiance of the Roman Catholic system as it existed. 28, all that God has allowed or not forbidden is right. Hence, marriage is permitted to all human beings, and they're a defense of his own marriage. 34, there is no ground in the teaching of Christ for the pretensions of the so-called spiritual authority. In other words, the the Pope and the bishops and cardinals and the priests and all of that, that entire hierarchy of Roman Catholic superstructure, Zwingli denounced it all as being false because it did not find its basis in the teaching of Christ, in the scriptures. So Christ is the head of the church. He's the authority, not the Catholic system. 35, whereas the jurisdiction and authority of the secular power is based on the teachings and actions of Christ, namely in Romans 13, and of course where Christ himself said, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. So Zwingli here, remember, he's trying to convince the Zurich City Council to go Protestant. Well, how is he going to convince them of that? By telling them, look, your authority is established in Scripture, but the authority of that guy over in Rome that you keep paying taxes to and sending your young men to go fight off in his wars... That authority is not established in Scripture. Well, that's going to resonate with the leaders of Zurich who uh, are very open to the idea of being completely autonomous in every way. All right, number 36. All the rights and protection that the so-called spiritual authority claims, so everything that Rome thinks it has in terms of um, money and power and land and the right to raise an army to go fight a war, all of that actually belongs biblically to secular governments, provided they are Christian governments. And that's Zwingli's way again of, I think, kind of dangling the carrot out there in front of the Zurich City Council. Now, he certainly believed that, and he found it in passages like Romans 13. To them, likewise, all Christians owe obedience without exception. So then number 63, to sum up, that realm is best and most stable, which is ruled in accordance with God's will alone, and the worst and, is, and weakest is that which is ruled arbitrarily. So if you let Rome continue to have influence over us, that's an arbitrary rule. That's going to weaken us. We need to get rid of that and just go back to what the Bible itself allows us to have, which is the government that is already established here locally. 
Uh, the result then of the first disputation is that, as we saw in that earlier slide, the Zurich City Council overwhelmingly embraces this, and it is now, Zurich has already been an independent government for many centuries, but now it is also independent from the Roman Catholic Church. It becomes the first Protestant Swiss canton, and there will be other cantons in Switzerland who will follow suit. Later that year, in October of 1523, there's a second disputation, and uh, this is to continue the work of reform. So Zwingli is being careful to garner the favor and support of the city council as he continues to make these reforms in the church. Here we have over 900 who come to this three-day event. And as a result of this second disputation, <clears throat> Zurich allows Zwingli to make massive reforms. So they've declared themselves Protestant in January, and now in October of that same year, they are really being aggressive in the reform that they are making in the church. And so they remove all of the images from the churches. They bury the bones of saints rather than, you know... <clears throat> keeping them on display as relics and objects of veneration. They bury them in the ground. Uh, all of the altars are replaced by simple tables. Even the organ in the church is taken out because Zwingli doesn't find musical instruments in the New Testament. Therefore, there shouldn't be any musical instruments in the church. That's his line of reasoning. Uh, I don't fully agree with that line of reasoning completely, but it's interesting to see how he got there. Gold and silver are melted from the relics and the crucifixes, and then the monasteries are transformed into shelters and schools. So in, in Wittenberg, Luther wants to be much, much more slow and methodical in the Reformation effort. He wants it to be the Word of God changing people's opinions and then slowly seeing reform take place. Zwingli is much more aggressive. He with the backing of the city council, goes into the cathedral and takes everything out. Yep, Chris. your understanding of the time and what was going on um, in the nations that they were in, what's your opinion on, since they're taking a look, two different polar ideas on how they want to go about changing, um, just your personal kind of thoughts about it? Yeah. Well, just to rehearse a little bit of what we talked about last week, we have the normative principle, which is Luther's view, which is to say if the Bible doesn't specifically prohibit something, then we're going to allow it to continue. Zwingli's on the other end of that spectrum with what's called the regulative principle or the reformed principle, which is if the New Testament does not specifically command us to do it in the church, then we're not going to do it in the church. Now, in broader society, he was more flexible. He was a little bit more like Luther. Uh, Zwingli himself loved music. He wrote music and um, even you know, had no objection to musical instruments in broader society. He was applying that principle specifically to the church. Um, I personally would lean towards the regulative principle more than the normative principle. I, I don't think... It's necessarily the right stance to say, well, just because the Bible didn't specifically address that one issue means that it's fair game. Um, but admittedly, we are talking about, I think, what we would call gray areas to a certain extent. I do think that there are biblical principles and biblical parameters that allow us to make wise and God-honoring decisions in any gray area, even if it's not specifically addressed in scripture. Um, you know, even in our own day, the um, advances of technology have certainly caused us to ask certain questions that uh, the New Testament writers did not have to specifically address because those forms of technology had not been invented yet. For example, the whole multi-site question is a question that I think really does come down to the normative, regulative principle in the church, is it appropriate to have a multi-site model? And I would derive principles from uh, even 1 Peter 5 that 
as elders and pastors, we are called to shepherd the flock of God among you, which I think really calls into question whether or not a pastor can be an effective shepherd of congregations that are, in some cases, hundreds or perhaps even thousands of miles apart. So I don't think the multi-site model is a good model because there's principles in Scripture that I, I think apply to it. But if you took more of a normative approach, you would say, well, the New Testament never prohibits multi-site, so therefore it's okay. If you took the regulative approach, well, the, the New Testament certainly doesn't uh, commend specifically multi-site, so we're not going to do it. So you can see how that approach and that thinking is still very practical for the gray areas that we encounter in ministry today. I do think that the Scripture, the New Testament, is fully sufficient for us to have all of the adequate principles and information we need to make God-honoring decisions. And I also think this is why it's so important to have a godly and unified elder board that can help you as a pastor make those decisions using biblical principles, staying within biblical parameters, and applying wisdom to the specific situation and circumstance that you find yourself in in ministry. So I guess I'm kind of talking around it, but me personally, I would lean towards the regulative principle, but I would not go so far as to say no musical instruments in church, uh, because I think, that's, I think that's overly extreme, especially since if you take the entire corpus of Scripture, the book of Psalms talks about musical instruments time after time after time. So um, I have no problem whatsoever with musical instruments in, in the church. And though I enjoy a cappella singing, uh, I think instrumentation adds a great deal of God-honoring supplement to the worship experience. So, yep. Aaron. Was it basically understood and assumed by all good Christian men that there are some <clears throat> religious sense? For example, were there any secular voices at this time when they're thinking about reform, or was it just assumed that it's either going to be this or it's going to be this religion? Um, it's either going to be Catholic or Protestant. Were there any dissenting kind of secular sort of voices in this part of the world in this particular time? Not quite yet. There will be. There will be. When we get into the 1600s, we'll start to have the birth of the Enlightenment. I mean, certainly there was an element of worldliness that had come in through the Renaissance, and uh, that was the whole reason that Savonarola had his Reformation there in Florence, because he saw the worldliness of the Medici family and certainly saw the corruption of the Catholic Church, and he wanted to reform all of that. So, yes, I mean, you do have unbelievers. Calvin will fight against a group known as the Libertines who are... They're not secular in the sense that they deny the existence of God or deny Christianity, but they certainly don't like some of the strict moral ethical implications that Calvin wants to impose through his strict interpretation of the scripture. But when we get into the 1600s, about 150 years after this, we're going to start to have the birth of Enlightenment thinking, which in some ways is almost a product of the freedom that comes as a result of the Reformation. So the Reformation starts to bring this idea of religious freedom, and that idea of religious freedom then enables people who otherwise would have been killed in earlier centuries to start to even deny the very existence of God, to deny the supernaturalness of the Bible. And uh, through Rene Descartes, who emphasizes human reason, and John Locke, who emphasizes science, we will have the exaltation of science and reason above the authority of revelation. And in the Enlightenment, that's really what you have, is you have two authority structures. Even in the Reformation, it's two authority structures that are colliding. Is it the Pope or is it the Scripture alone? In the Enlightenment, is, is it human reason and empirical science, or is it the revelation of Scripture? And those two things, again, collide in the Enlightenment. And the product of that is liberalism and atheism and secularism and uh, we'll we'll trace the the history of all that when we get there but that is coming but it really hasn't shown up at least not in the full force that it will at this point in church history it really is are you protestant or are you catholic because it seems that there are a lot of secular um if not in 
in belief but in practice because a lot of the the way that you mentioned for example when they're debating between Catholicism and Protestantism the reason they went with the Protestant view wasn't necessarily or it didn't seem to me at least necessarily because simply they believe wholeheartedly in these truths of scripture but they just thought that this was best for them um, in order to stop paying taxes to, to Rome or, or whatever so it seems like there's secular but they're not willing to um, express that yeah I think the, I mean you probably have a spectrum w represented for Zwingli certainly he believed that these were the truths of the Word of God and they were convictions in his own heart but I think he had the political savvy to know that if he was going to convince the city council to go along with this, he needed to present it in a way that made sense to them. And so the, the 67 articles, I wouldn't say that they were, I, I don't think he compromised in the sense that it was all just political convenience, uh, but I do think he framed the discussion in such a way that he knew would appeal to the, um, to some of the just, nationalism, I realize it's a city-state, but some of the nationalism that was there already in the hearts of those who ruled the city of Zurich. All right, uh, at this time, here's a relief of Zwingli preaching the Word of God and the people hearing him preach. And uh, it was around this time that Zwingli preached a famous message known as the Shepherd, full title, How One Can Recognize True Christian Shepherds and Also the False and moreover, how one should behave in regard to them. And this is a clear statement of Roman Catholic hierarchy represent the false shepherds and those who are true to the word of God and the authority of Christ in his word are the true shepherds. And we're starting to have, again, that, that dividing line being very clearly drawn in Zwingli's ministry. Additional reforms. April 16th, 1525, Zwingli abolished the Mass, celebrated his first Lord's Supper. He sat at a simple table. He read not in Latin, but in German. And uh, this was really radical. Both elements were given to the uh, lay people, the congregation, to partake of, both the bread and the cup. In the traditional Roman Catholic system, only the bread was given to the congregation the cup was taken only by the priest. I, I don't know if that's still how it is today in the Catholic Church. I think they've modified that since the Second Vatican Council. All right, later in 1525, Zwingli would also perform an infant baptism service in the common language of the people, and uh, you can see how he is making these reforms. All right, now up to this point, uh, we have presented Zwingli in an almost entirely positive light, and I think there is much that can be said about Zwingli that is very, very positive. In particular, the thing that I love about Ulrich Zwingli is that he was committed to the Word of God, and he wanted to see reforms made in his church that were consistent with the Word of God, and he preached expositorily, verse by verse, through the New Testament. All of those things make him very much a Reformation hero in my perspective. Now, having said all of that, uh, there is a kind of big black mark on his record, uh, so to speak, when it comes to a group of students that he had been mentoring through this entire process. And the students got it. They, they got the, the heart and message of what Zwingli was trying to do, which is this. We want to make reforms according to the Scripture because the Scripture is our highest authority. And as they were working through the Scriptures with Zwingli, making these reforms, remember the regulative principle, if it's not in the Bible, we don't do it in church. They came to conclude that infant baptism is not something that we should still be doing. Infant baptism is not commanded in the New Testament. Infant baptism, is, there's no example of it in the New Testament. And uh, so it seemed to these students, and uh, according to some accounts, even to Zwingli himself in private, 
that perhaps infant baptism ought to be done away with. It's another one of the reforms that needed to be made. Problem is that Zwingli knew that he would not be able to convince the city council to, uh, to change their perspective on infant baptism. In fact, at this time in Europe's history, the way that you really became a citizen was through being christened or baptized as a baby. So this is not just like, hey, we're going to change the mode of baptism and it'll have you know, minor effects on things. This now strikes at the heart of the social order because if you, if you change from infant baptism to believer's baptism, you have to you know, re-baptize everybody. And the whole process of the way that even people became citizens is threatened by this. Now, I'm not saying that that's a good excuse. I'm just saying that that's an explanation for why Zwingli ultimately did not go to what was a biblical and logical conclusion of his own teaching and his own views. But his students were like, who cares what the implications of this are? If the Bible says it and teaches it, then we are bound to do what the scripture commands us to do and not what the city council of Zurich allows us to do. Well, there's going to be a conflict now between Zwingli, the discipler, and the guys who met with him there at the Starbucks in Zurich for their weekly discipleship. And there is a Starbucks in Zurich. I've been there. Uh, but it wasn't there at this time. <laughs> uh, so we'll talk just a little bit about that conflict. Uh, here is Zwingli, a couple different pictures of him. In almost every picture or painting of him, he does have his doctor's cap on. Um, so you'll see most of the pictures with Zwingli where he's wearing a hat. That's neither here nor there, but it's just a little extra insight for you. So let's talk a little bit about the Anabaptists. Uh, we will get into quite a bit more detail in discussing the Anabaptists. When we are talking about Anabaptists in this context, we are specifically talking about the Swiss Brethren. The Swiss Brethren was only one group of Anabaptists. There were many other groups of Anabaptists, and I would put the Swiss Brethren in the more responsible group of Anabaptists, not like some of the others. So Zwingli had studied the Bible with this group of men and had reached a number of biblical conclusions with them and uh, they concluded that infant baptism had to go. When the town council of Zurich did not initially allow the mass to be abolished in 1523, they did allow it to be abolished in 1525, which is when Zwingli finally abolished it. Some of those students argued that Zwingli should go against the city council and abolish the mass anyway, and Zwingli refused. So in their mind, in the mind of the students, this represented a major point of compromise on Zwingli's part. He had been discipling them that the word of God is the only authority, and then in practice, he lived as though the, the city council was actually the ultimate authority. And they just couldn't get their minds around this, and so they parted with Zwingli. They felt betrayed by him, and they continued to study the Bible on their own. Their study of the scriptures led them to conclude that infant baptism is not biblical, it is not in the New Testament, and therefore it should not be part of regular church practice. So in 1525... Zwingli has a third disputation, but this time the disputation is not against the Catholics. It is against his former disciples, a group that will become known as the Anabaptists or the Catabaptists, a word that means re-baptizers, because they argued that those who had been baptized as infants needed to be baptized again as adults, as believers. Key individuals among the Swiss Brethren, Conrad Grebel, Felix Mons, George Blaurock, and Balthazar Hubmeyer. And we'll talk just a little bit about some of these people. The city council sided with Zwingli when Zwingli defended infant baptism. And um, it was really Zwingli siding with them and then them affirming him as a result of that. And the consequence of all of this was that Grebel and the others were ordered to baptize their children. They were forbidden to meet in private. 
and they were threatened with banishment, and eventually some of them will be killed for breaking these laws. All right, here are kind of a summary of the arguments that were used between Zwingli and the Anabaptists. And I think you'll be encouraged by this because you'll see that the arguments the Swiss Brethren brought up are pretty much the same arguments that you and I would bring up to defend believers' baptism. So Zwingli argued that sons of God's children are also God's children, sort of a covenant community idea. The Anabaptists taught that no, only believers are God's children because only believers have experienced the new birth. Zwingli argued that infant baptism is parallel to Old Testament circumcision. And the Anabaptists said, no, New Testament baptism is not related to circumcision at all. And um, actually, a really good article on the the parallels between circumcision and um, baptism, which, by the way, that the correspondence between those two things was not made in church history until about the 5th or 6th century when there needed to be a theological explanation for why infant baptism was occurring. Infant baptism actually started because people were afraid that if they didn't baptize their babies, that the, those babies wouldn't go to heaven, um, a misconstrual of what the external act of baptism really does. Uh, In a day when you have a high infant mortality rate, people wanted to baptize their babies quickly in case the baby didn't survive to adulthood to sort of ensure that the baby would go to heaven. Uh, Obviously a misunderstanding of, of baptism. But there needed to be some sort of theological explanation for why this took place, and so there was the correlation then made with Old Testament circumcision. But if you want a really good article, I think, a really helpful article on this issue... Uh, John Piper, in his book, Brothers, We Are Not Professionals, wrote a great chapter on the issue of baptism. And he actually says, okay, for the sake of argument, I'm willing to accept this idea that circumcision is somehow parallel to baptism. But circumcision is a physical, physical right that applies to physical birth. Baptism is a right that applies to spiritual birth. So there's a sense in which we do baptize babies, but we baptize spiritual babies, and spiritual babies only are born after they are regenerated by the Holy Spirit, which means you have to practice believer's baptism because those are the only spiritual babies that exist. So that's kind of Piper's argument in that chapter. It's, it's, I think, well done and, and very interesting. But in any case, here we have kind of the typical argument from Zwingli. Zwingli says the household baptisms of Acts support infant baptism, and the Anabaptists are quick to point out that the household baptisms do not mention infants. So here we really have Zwingli's regulative principle being used against him. Nowhere in the New Testament does it specifically command infant baptism. Therefore, we should not do it in the church. Zwingli, infant baptism is not directly condemned. Anabaptist, infant baptism is not specifically taught. Uh, So Zwingli really, in this case, becomes inconsistent and uh, uses the normative principle of Luther rather than sticking with his regulative principle. Zwingli, the New Testament does not teach rebaptism. The Anabaptists, neither do we. We're teaching real baptism. Infant baptism is just a bath. It's not actually anything. Zwingli, Christ blessed the little children and said those in the kingdom must be like little children. And the Anabaptist said, if all little children are saved, then why baptize at all, since baptism is a mark that distinguishes believers from unbelievers. Children are sanctified by the parents, and the Anabaptist said, no, children are sanctified by the gospel, which is in the scriptures. So there you have sort of the typical arguments pro and against, and in kind of a bizarre twist, Zwingli ends up becoming almost an anti-Zwingli in that he supports a position that logically does not fit with the pattern up to this point. Uh, Here we have a picture of Zwingli during some of his disputations, still wearing that hat, so that's good. Uh, The result of all this is that there will now be violence between Zwingli and his former disciples which is really just a very sad and tragic end 
to what started as a group of men studying the Bible in order to be consistent and obedient to what the Bible teaches. Twelve men then meet in the home of Felix Mons, and they perform believer's baptism. George Blaurock goes house to house. I mean, this is in direct violation now of the prohibition set up by the, the Zurich City Council against them. Hubmeyer publishes pamphlets against Zwingli. Zwingli responds with his own pamphlets against Hubmeyer. And then in March of 1526, the town council issues the death penalty now for rebaptism. Um, there is a sense in which it's the town council now that will persecute the Anabaptists. Zwingli is not the one who actually goes out and kills them. It's the city council that issues the death penalty, and some of them are, are killed and executed as a result of going against the city council. But in the minds of the Anabaptists themselves, they see this very much as an act of betrayal from Zwingli personally. It is personal in their minds because Zwingli is the one that convinces the city council ultimately to maintain its system of infant baptism, and he is the one certainly who could have, could have supported further reform and instead tries to silence and suffocate any who would promote what the Bible teaches about baptism. And so the idea from the city council is, if you want to baptize, then we will baptize you. So we'll baptize you in a way that's permanent and guarantees that you stay at the bottom of the river. So Protestants in Zurich now begin to persecute fellow Protestants over the issue of baptism, and they drown those who are found guilty of practicing re-baptism. on Zwingli before, but I wonder how far do we take when we consider someone like Zwingli? Because I'm considering what you said about how it is said maybe in private he agreed. And you have this reform position which is just standing up for your convictions and what you believe in. There's obviously such a clear um, deviation from that by Zwingli, for whatever reason. And I guess the, this is what I'm trying to wrestle with. Like, Where do you, when you think about these men, like he's clear, he, if that is true, he's going against his own convictions for the sake of political gain. Do you follow what I'm saying? Like, where do we, as we're discerning these church fathers, you know, draw the line? Yeah, well, you're hitting at the real heart of the issue, and now you can see why Verduin is so mad when he writes that book. I mean, where is all of this angst coming from? Well, this is where the angst is coming from, because the friction at times feels almost inexcusable. Now, from Zwingli's perspective, look, my whole heritage is Anabaptist, all right? My whole heritage is Mennonite. So I am very much um, sympathetic with the Swiss Brethren. And certainly, we all embrace believers' baptism. And it's a little strange to recognize the fact that if we were alive in Zurich in the 1500s, we would be persecuted for the way we believe baptism ought to be done biblically. So we can kind of all appreciate the Anabaptist perspective on this. But for the sake of argument, if I take Zwingli's perspective, Zwingli was so committed to, I think, the sovereign working of God through the political authority that he felt as though, even though his preference probably would have been to make changes even with regard to baptism. At least initially, I think he hardened against it later as the issue became um, more polarizing. He was probably open to it originally, but certainly came to be against it as the Anabaptist issue escalated. But I think when the city council, when he knew that the city council would oppose it, he thought, well, I'm going to go with the city council because I'm going to submit to their authority on something that maybe he saw as a non-essential issue, or I don't know exactly, but for him, the issue was the issue of the city council's authority in the city of Zurich. And when the Anabaptists started going door-to-door -door preaching believer's baptism and practicing believer's baptism, he saw it not so much as you guys are practicing an unbiblical form of baptism, but more as you are violating the command of Romans 13 to submit to the government. And you, therefore, deserve to pay the penalty that that government puts in place for breaking its laws. 
So I think Zwingli's perspective was more, you guys are threatening to undo everything we've accomplished by actually going against the civil authority that has enabled us to accomplish so much. Now, switching from that perspective to the Anabaptists, the Anabaptists are there with Peter in Acts 4. It is better to obey God than to obey men, and we're not going to put up with something that is clearly an unbiblical, traditional practice just for the sake of maintaining some level of political peace and harmony. And Zwingli, you're the one who taught us this, and we are simply being consistent with what you poured into us how is it that then you could turn on us and persecute us for being consistent with what you yourself championed? So there's the tension, and there's the angst, and there's Verduin's book. <laughs> and you read it and you go, wow, this guy, is, he's mad. Oh, well, why is he so upset? He's upset because of that very issue. Yep. Verduin's reformed himself too, right? That's my understanding. I don't know that much about... Uh, his specific background, um, but I, I believe that he is, at least in terms of his soteriology. No, but well, I was, I, I could, it's just an internet source, but like he was a part of the CRC. Okay. Yep. And um, he was baptized when he was three years old, which didn't make him. They made fun of him in the Reformed Church because of that, because he wasn't truly reformed. He wasn't truly a baby when yeah, he was baptized. Truly, yeah, I guess. You know, <laughs> um, but that he did sympathize, sympathize with his Mennonite students when yeah. he taught at the university. Okay. So I was just confused by him because he went to Calvin College. Yeah. I'm thinking, okay, this guy's either walked away or, you know, from what I understand, he still stayed in that tradition. But Well, <clears throat> even, I mean, uh, Stander and Lowe, the two guys who wrote the book Baptism in the Early Church that, you, that we looked at for the first semester class, they were a lot nicer about it, but um, they're Dutch Reformed, and yet they're writing a book that's critiquing infant baptism uh, from a patristic standpoint. So um, that, would, that would be interesting. I don't know a lot about Verduin's background, um, but it's very interesting what you're bringing up about him being part of a Reformed background and yet criticizing the way that some of the reformers responded to the Anabaptists. But, again, when we talk about the Anabaptists, which at this point will be on Thursday, uh, but when we talk about the Anabaptists, I'm going to give you context that helps you understand why the reformers thought about them the way that they did. So I don't think it was completely... Um, well, I think Verduin maybe goes a little too far sometimes in making it sound like there's no explanation at all. I think there is an explanation. I don't know that it's an excuse, but I think there is an explanation, and we'll, we'll talk about that more on Thursday. Is there another hand? Yep. How Danny. are the Anabaptists then different from the Anabaptists now? How are the Anabaptists then different from the Anabaptists now? Um, <clears throat> well, It depends on which specific group of Anabaptists you're talking about. But when we talk about, for example, the Anabaptists in Germany who Luther first encounters, those Anabaptists, they not only teach believers baptism, but they also want a complete overturn of the entire aristocratic system. Some of them are outright communists. They want communism brought in. They want political revolution to be part of the Reformation. And it all ends really badly in the Munster Rebellion in 1535 and 36, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that um, on Thursday. But it, it all ends very, very badly. And when Menno Simons begins to kind of reconstitute the Anabaptist movement in Germany and in parts of the Holy Roman Empire in Prussia, that area, um, he determines that, that his movement, the movement that he's part of, will never again be characterized by revolutionary tendencies. And the pendulum swings completely to the other side, and the Anabaptists, who have a reputation for being um, revolutionaries and, and even anarchists, now get a reputation for being pacifists. And so you look at the Mennonite movement today and some of the offshoots of that, uh, even the Amish and other movements come out of the Anabaptist movement uh, they are largely pacifists because of the reaction that they had to even some of the early years of their own history. So that would be one example. 
Uh, and it will be through Anabaptist influence on an Englishman named John Smith or Smythe in, around 1609 that will have the beginnings of the Baptist movement in England. And, um, and we'll talk a lot more about that later. So, so the Baptist movement, to a certain degree, owes its origination to this Anabaptist movement. All right, let's talk just a little bit more about the Anabaptists. And again, uh, recognizing we're going to spend a whole lecture on the Anabaptists as a general group. Here we're talking specifically about the Swiss Brethren. So here's Zwingli writing against the Anabaptists. And I actually think this would make a great blog article title, A Refutation of the Tricks of the Baptists. That's awesome. I, I don't know what the blog article would be about, but if Zwingli wrote it, this is what it would be about. When they saw themselves beaten after considerable conflict, in other words, when I destroyed them in that disputation in 1525, and when we, the me and the city council, had exhorted them in friendly ways, we broke up in such a way that many of them promised they would make no disturbance. So they said they would be cooperative and quiet, uh, but they didn't promise to give up their views. Well, that's Zwingli's opinion, at least. Within three or at most four days, it was announced that the leaders of the sect had baptized 15 brethren. So they, they said they would go away quietly, and they didn't. Then we began to perceive why they had determined to collect a new church and had opposed infant baptism so seriously. So he sees it as they're just using infant baptism as a catalyst for creating division in the church. We warned the church that it could not be maintained that this proceeded from good counsel to say nothing of a good spirit. And for these reasons, they had attempted a division and partition of the church. And this was just as hypocritical as the superstition of the monks. So the Anabaptists are just as bad as the Catholics in Zwingli's view. Secondly, though the churches had to preserve their liberty of judging concerning doctrine, they had set up catabaptism, that's rebaptism, without any conference, for during the whole battle about infant baptism, they said nothing about rebaptism. Third, this catabaptism seemed like the watchword of seditious men. So for Zwingli, it's not so much about baptism, it's about sedition and treachery and division and political revolution undermining the authority of the Zurich City Council and the church. Then when they learned this in great swarms, they came into the city unbelted and girded with rope and prophesied as they called it in the marketplace and squares. They filled the air with their cries about the old dragon as they called me and his heads as they called the other ministers of the word. They also commended their justice and innocence to all for they were all about to depart. They boasted that already they hold all things in common. So now he's accusing them of being communists and threatened with extremes, others unless they do the same. They went through the streets with portentous uproar crying, woe to Zurich. All right, so he's presenting them certainly in a very negative light. But again, he sees them as a threat to the social order. Therefore, establish your courage, good brethren. The hypocrisy of the Roman Pope has been brought into the light, and now we must war with hypocrisy itself. And you must do this with the less delay, the more you see those apostles of the devil. Although they promise, I know not what salvation, seeking nothing but disturbance in the confusion of affairs, both human and divine, and destruction. So much about their division and betrayal of the church. They have gone out from us, for they were not of us. All right, so there's Zwingli's take. Now, I sympathize more with the Swiss brethren because I do think that Zwingli betrayed them in a, in a real sense. But if you're wondering how in the world Zwingli could do that in terms of an explanation for it, this is why. He saw it as the creating of unnecessary division, sedition, and the undermining of the authority of both the Zurich City Council and the church in Zurich at a moment when unity was absolutely necessary. Yep, Cameron. Um, just uh, for my information, were they, um, the Anabaptists, when... When it started, were they told to leave town first? Was that the first thing they were told to do? Like, was there a build-up to the drowning, uh, not to justify the drowning, but was there an escalation before that happened? Yes, there was. 
a warning to stop teaching others, a warning to stop baptizing others, and according to Zwingli here, agreement on their part that they would go quietly, and while they wouldn't change their views, they wouldn't promote them, and therefore they wouldn't undermine the authority of the Zurich City Council or of what was being taught by the Church of Zurich. Then, within a few weeks, they start their own church and create division in the city of Zurich, the city council responds to that division by saying, if you're part of the division, then you will be executed. And they continue to do it anyway, so there is an escalation. They continue to do it anyway, and then they're arrested by the city council, and then they're drowned. Weren't they told to leave? Weren't they told to... Uh, just one of the textbooks you've given us, I can't remember which one, I thought said that they were told to leave. To yes, they were... Sent- they were told to either keep quiet or to get out of town. And um, some of them did leave and some of them, but there's nowhere, there's really nowhere for them to go. That's, you know, the whole argument that we, or the whole thing that we talked about earlier with regard to the separation of church and state. Did the Anabaptists initially teach separation of church and state or was it more a reaction to teach separation of church and state because there was nowhere in Europe where there was a separation of church and state and therefore nowhere in Europe where they could go and uh, have some level of religious freedom? The answer is, well, people debate both sides of that because there really is nowhere else for them to go. And if they go into Catholic territories, they will be arrested and they will be executed. And it will not be by drowning, it will be by burning at the stake because that's how the Catholics treat heretics. Um, So um, there isn't really anywhere for them to go, and they're not willing to just be quiet about what they believe to be a biblical conviction. And so as a result, they violate the city ordinance, that many of them are arrested, and then many of them are killed. So... I explain all of this to you because I want to put a little bit of Verduin's argument in context. Again, I don't think it's an excuse for the way that Zwingli responded to the Anabaptists. I don't think it's an excuse, but I do think it's an explanation. (coughs) All right. Um... The heresy of Anabaptism then met with serious persecution. The Anabaptists were, at times, misrepresented by Zwingli, who presented them in the absolute worst possible light. We have Felix Mons arrested and drowned in 1527. There was actually a man named Eberly Bolt, who was the first to be executed. He was executed in, I believe it was 1525 or 26. Hubmeyer was arrested in a Catholic territory and burned at the stake in 1528. Blaurock was imprisoned and beaten. He left uh, Zurich and then was ar- arrested, I believe it was in Austria, and uh, by Catholic authorities and was also burned at the stake. Out of this, however, the Swiss Brethren Church was born and suppression of this movement consumed Zwingli until the end of his life. And here we have a painting of Anabaptists there in Lake Zurich who are being executed by drowning. So again, the idea is if you want to baptize by immersion, then you yourself will be immersed permanently. All right, just a few things in the final minutes that we have as we finish up on Zwingli's life. In 1529, Zwingli met with Luther at Marburg in Germany, and this is called the Colloquy of Marburg, and they agreed on every nuance of Protestant theology except for one, and it was the other one of the two ordinances. So Zwingli can't agree with the Anabaptists on baptism, and he can't agree with Luther on communion. And so as I mentioned in a previous class period, we really have a division within the Protestant movement, a trifold division at this point. We have the Lutherans, we have the Reformed movement, and we have the Anabaptists. And what is it that separates and distinguishes these three movements? It is the ordinances. The Lutherans and the Reformed movement cannot agree on communion, and the Reformed movement and the Anabaptists cannot agree on baptism. Certainly the Lutherans don't agree with the Anabaptists on that point either. But it is interesting, I think, that 
in today's age, we have meetings, and I think it's a good thing, I'm not complaining about it, but we have meetings called Together for the Gospel and the Gospel Coalition, where we emphasize unity on the gospel in spite of differences on how we practice the ordinances. In the Reformation period, there was unity on the gospel, and yet there were severe divisions caused because of a disagreement about how to practice the ordinances. Just kind of an interesting thing to consider. And at what time, at what point in history did, did that start to occur where we start saying, okay, well, we're not going to divide on secondary issues, we're united on the gospel, and, and these things are, you know, because I mean, I, I think of like John MacArthur, R.C. Sproul, back in these days, they would call each other heretics. And then today they're, they're good friends. At what point did that start to, to happen? Yeah, well, I think certainly within a Certainly within an American context, the three main denominations that we have at the beginning of, um, of the colonial, um, uh, of the American colonies, what becomes the United States of America, would be the Reformed group, uh, Congregational slash Presbyterianism. And then we have Baptists, uh, Roger Williams being the first Baptist. Uh, he was a Reformed Baptist, by the way, which is why Providence, Rhode Island is not free will Rhode Island. Um, but anyway, and, and, then we have, um, and then we have the Methodists, which come out of the evangelical or great awakening of the mid-1730s. Uh, they're still fairly isolated, though I think there maybe is some level of cooperation. I think where you really start to see cooperation interdenominationally, uh, at least in recent history, is with the the inroads of liberalism, which come out of Germany in the 19th century and really infect the American religious scene so that you now have liberal Christians and you have what are called fundamentalist Christians. And the fundamentalists rally around the five fundamentals of the faith, which have nothing to do with baptism or communion or any of those things. And so you have Presbyterians like Machen and you have Baptists and you have Methodists who are all coming together and saying, hey, we, we rally around these fundamentals. And so the presence almost of a common enemy in liberalism unites the denominations together for the gospel, uh, which, I mean, we call ourselves evangelicals now, but evangelicalism, neo-evangelicalism is an offshoot of fundamentalism. Okay, we've got just a couple minutes, so I want to finish this up. <clears throat> Back in Zurich, tension mounts between Protestant cantons and Catholic cantons or provinces. And so you have now Catholic provinces in Switzerland that are attacking the Protestant provinces. In fact, there is a missionary that is sent out... Um, from, a, from the Protestants to the Catholics, he gets burned at the stake. Zwingli is so incensed by that that um, really it, it creates war. Um, and so we have two wars now, the two wars of Capel, where there are thousands of Catholic soldiers against a greatly outnumbered Protestant army from Zurich. Uh, Zurich is able to hold them off, but Zwingli goes out. And, you know, As a young man, he had been a chaplain with some of the mercenary armies, and now he goes out as a chaplain with the armies of Zurich. But when we say chaplain, he was very much an armed combatant, okay? And I think that's important to understand. Zwingli died swinging a sword, and he was killed in the Second War of Capel. It's, it's almost a poetic ending to the life of a man who, at least at the end of his life, spent so much of his time fighting that, uh, that he would die with a sword in his hand. Here's the colloquy of Marburg with Philip of Hesse in the middle, and uh, Luther is on the right, and Zwingli is on the left, and they're talking about those things. All right, there's this statue there in Zurich today. Uh, Ulrich Zwingli, by the way, when the Catholics figured out who he was dead there on the battlefield, they cut his body up into little pieces and then burned him to ashes and spread him all over the place so there would never be a grave for Zwingli. But there is a statue there that commemorates his life. And one of the things I want you to notice, you can just barely see it there, uh, but he's holding a book. And then, of course, he has a big sword in front of him. And I think, I think that adequately summarizes Zwingli's legacy in the sense that he is holding the text of Scripture, the Bible. He's holding the Bible close to his heart, but 
he never fully lets go of the giant broadsword that he's holding as well. So, um, and, and granted, he's at a time in history where Protestants did have to defend themselves against the armies of the Catholics. So there is an explanation for that as well, but it almost is a summary of his personality that uh, he loves the truth, but he's also not afraid to fight and not just fight in a metaphorical way. So that's, that's Ulrich Zwingli. What do we do with him? Well, there's much that we appreciate and there's much that we find concerning. So we have him laying the foundation of the Swiss Reformation. We have him crystallizing Reformed theology in his 67 articles. Heinrich Bullinger, and in fact, I have a few more slides in this slideshow about Bullinger, which we won't look at today, but Bullinger is very influential. He's a contemporary of John Calvin. Calvin and Bullinger meet together, and they agree that they agree on everything, including how they view the Lord's Supper. He's committed to the original languages and to Bible exposition, and there's a sense in which he helped spark the Baptist movement, even though uh, it wasn't so much his desire to do so. But he was a sinner, sinner saved by grace, just like all of us are, and as a result, he had areas of blindness and weakness and fault. He overemphasized the church-state paradigm. He betrayed his Baptist students when it became expedient to do so. He was quick to pursue violence, and there were times when he did not take his own reforms far enough. So, my encouragement to you is not to go to one extreme or the other in the way that you view Zwingli. I think it's important to view Zwingli with nuance, with appreciation for his strengths, and taking to heart the warning that we learned from his weaknesses, and praising God for the way that he used an imperfect man to accomplish some incredible things.